So welcome, welcome back to the National Security College here at the Australian National University and welcome also to the many who are listening or watching on the, uh, on the webcast. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we're meeting this evening, the Ngunnawal people, and to celebrate their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Rory Medcalf. I'm the head of the National Security College here at the Australian National University, and it's a real pleasure to welcome this distinguished and diverse audience, uh, a real cross-section of current and future leaders and also observers, informed observers of Australia's policy debate and our national security community. Uh, just a reminder that this event is being webcast and recorded, so please keep those phones on silent. Uh, this event will be available afterwards on the ANU YouTube channel and the National Security Podcast, so it will very much be an enduring resource. I also want to welcome those who are tuning in from elsewhere in Australia and internationally. Now, this has been clearly a tough year for many of us personally, and also a very difficult year for institutions and for nations. So it's fitting that as the National Security College enters its second decade, we provide a platform for leading practitioners and thinkers of policy and security to share their insights with the, the public debate. And certainly our guest speaker today, uh, Mike Pizzullo, the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs, uh, is both an exceptional policy practitioner and a renowned policy thinker. And we will hear from Michael Pizzullo very shortly. Uh, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my boss, the Vice-Chancellor of ANU, Professor Brian Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you, uh, Rory. Uh, let me acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting this evening. Pay my respect to the elders past and present. Uh, that is the Nunnawal Nambri people here uh, out on ANU, and uh, they have been meeting on this land for more than 20,000 years, so it's a great privilege to be there this evening. It is my privilege to welcome our guest speaker for this evening to ANU, one of the most experienced and accomplished leaders in national security, uh, Secretary Mike Pizzullo AO. Uh, I'd also like to welcome many of our distinguished guests, uh, General Angus Campbell, Great to have you back, Chief of the Defense Forces. Rachel Noble, great to have you here, uh, Director General of the Australian Signals Directorate. Uh, Paul Simon, uh, the Director General of the Australian uh, uh, Secret Intelligence Service. Uh, Michael Phelan, CEO of the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commissions. Michael Outram, the Commissioner of the Australian Border Force. Carolyn Miller, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and Chair of the National Security College Advisory Board. Uh, and many other distinguished guests. So it is a real heavy-hitting audience. Uh, the presence of such a substantial group from Australia's national security leadership is a measure of the significance of the remarks we are about to hear. It's also a testament to the work of the ANU uh, National Security College, led by Professor Rory Medcalf. This speech is part of a series to mark the 10th anniversary uh, of the establishment of the college, and in addition, to its core business of executive development and education, the NSC has proven a place for itself as an essential convener of the public policy conversation about security and Australia's future. The college is also a valued channel for expertise from right across ANU to engage with the government on problems facing our nation, and hopefully some opportunities occasionally, in this year of disruption and beyond. In fact, it is a microcosm of the kind of unified approach we need to take for this new era as a joint initiative of the university and of the Commonwealth, balancing trust and independence. Our speaker has previously described COVID-19 as a stress test for Australia's resilience and its institutions. And, and can I say, I feel a bit stressed right now. <laughs> This evening, we look forward to hearing more about how we can work together across government, the private sector, and communities to maintain a secure, a prosperous, and sustainable, cohesive Australia. Our speaker is ideally placed to advance such a vision this evening. Mike Pizzullo has dedicated his professional life to leading and making policy in Australia's national interest and has served with distinction under both coalition and labor governance. 
I could tell you some stories that Gareth told me, but uh, that would probably not be wise. So uh, I'm going to move on with the rest of the introduction. He's been at the forefront of change in the Australian national security community. He is the inaugural secretary of the Department of Home Affairs, having been appointed to that role uh, at its establishment um, in December 2017. Prior to this, he served as secretary of the Department of Immigration, uh, and Border Protection, and Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service. Much of his career has been in the Department of Defense, which he joined as a graduate way back in 1987. As Deputy Secretary for Strategy, he was principal author of the 2009 Defense White Paper, which anticipated much of today's strategic landscape. Mike is no stranger to Parliament House, having served as Deputy Chief of Staff to the Leader of the Opposition, Kim Beasley, and uh, my knowledge from Eric Gareth as, as the staff of then Foreign Minister Gareth Evans. So uh, he has served two chancellors, uh, something that Mike and I have in common. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Secretary Pizzullo. Mike. Thank you, Brian, for that uh, very kind and warm uh, introduction. I won't extend tonight's proceedings by going over the same uh, greetings, but can I very sincerely thank my colleagues? We work very long, hard days, uh, and it's wonderful to see my closest national security colleagues uh, here with us tonight, uh, Angus, Rachel, and other colleagues, uh, including from the Home Affairs team, uh, Mike Field and, and Michael Outram. Uh, on indulgence, uh, Vice-Chancellor, if I might, if, can I, if I can also extend my greetings. We haven't seen much of each other today to my wife, Lynn. It's lovely having you here. One of the themes tonight will be that security is a collective endeavour and certainly so is raising a family. And darling, you've been uh, such a key intimate partner that you helped me with the preparation of this uh, address. Uh, and I have two, two of my sons here. I'm very proud to, to have Samuel and, and Anthony here tonight. Um, I'm not sure they thought that they'd won the Willy Wonka chocolate bar when they got the invite tonight, uh, but they said, well, we hear, we hear this every Sunday night around the barbecue table, so we might as well uh, spend the evening listen, listening to him go on about it as well in a professional setting. Uh, my address tonight is entitled On Security, and its subtitle is Security as a Positive and Unifying Force. Security should not be conflated with fear and anxiety. I recognise that over the course of the past four decades, the sum of fears has expanded in the security realm. In the 1980s, we feared nuclear annihilation. After 9-11, it was the global threat of violent Islamist extremism and the potential terrorist use of chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear weapons. In recent years, we have come to fear assaults from the natural world, extreme weather, climate change and pandemics. Fear and anxiety are, however, not security aids or tools. Security requires clear specification, the rational calculation of risk, and the purposeful enactment of measures taken in relation to defined problems. Of course, fear itself is a biosocial mechanism which is associated with our visceral responses of fight or flight in the face of sense danger. And at some deep level, anxiety too plays a role in vigilance and preparedness. But the unease and the alienation which is said to be located in human existence, at least according to thinkers such as Kierkegaard, Heidegger and Sartre, is not a force which is able to be mobilised in the security enterprise. We have to think differently about security as a concept and as an object of policy. In doing so, we need to leave some thinkers or at least some thinking behind. Take Hobbes. He was concerned with security against the attacker, whom we dread. In his masterpiece of political theory, Leviathan, published in 1651, we are presented with, famously, the war, the war of all against all. For Hobbes, while each of us is by right of nature the judge of what we must do to protect ourselves, the fear of death creates the basis for civil peace under the authority of the Leviathan to whom we cede the right to be the judge of what might threaten us. There are other conceptions of security which should be significantly reframed. For Foucault, 
Security effects are instances of power which are exercised in order to subjugate populations and to discipline bodies in a dialectic of master and slave, and to which I refer you particularly to his lectures to the Collège de France, uh, published over the course of 19, or given, I should say, over the course of 1970 to 1984. Foucault did not allow for the juridical establishment and protection of liberty, or for checks against power. Rather than focusing on the supposedly oppressive structures of power in liberal democracies, scholars in, in, inspired by Foucault might one day turn their attention to the disciplinary, to use his phrase, effects of the new surveillance technologies and practices which are today being deployed without juridical checks by authoritarian regimes. In Schmitt's, Karl Schmitt's more sinister conception, security is a signifier, a signifier of a reserve force, which is the preserve of the sovereign, who is able to decide what he termed as the state of exception, whereby norms and laws are suspended in the name of the emergency. Schmitt serves to remind us, even if only by our taking exception to his exception, that all emergency forms of power should be constitutionally grounded, codified as far as possible, and applied proportionately. Of course, thinking about security should continue to be necessarily concerned with, the co with concepts of power and the monopoly or otherwise of violence. If, for instance, a violent actor is located within a jurisdiction, security against that actor, as Hobbes suggested, is best located within a juridical framework of civil peace and laws, whereby the right to use force, except in instances of justify, justifiable self-defence, is yielded to the state. However, a view of security which is concerned exclusively with the administration of violence does not assist us to prepare for other dilemmas which might impinge on civil peace, such as a global pandemic or a potentially catastrophic geomagnetic storm, which could well occur on a scale which would render in most electrified technologies inoperable. Who is the attacker in that latter instance? The sun? Nature, or perhaps God himself. Of course, at one level, security dilemmas reduce logically to human difference and alterity, whether one reads Hobbes, Foucault, Schmidt or Heidegger, as already mentioned, or for that matter, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche or Derrida, to name a few of the other relevant thinkers in the Western philosophical tradition. In the absence of a transcendence of difference, that is to say, in the absence of a universal human society, Difference, alterity, the division of self and the other, the distinction of citizen and alien, to use another binary, or following Schmidt, friend and enemy, yet another binary, these distinctions will always present security, security dilemmas. Indeed, the very idea of alien is entrenched in the Australian Constitution at section 51, subsection 19, where we see an ancient word meaning the other of two, it's of proto-Indo-European origin, with the implication of the other being a stranger. The very idea of the, of the body politic carries with it exclusionary features, with signifiers such as sovereignty, jurisdiction, citizen, alien as mentioned, territory, border, quarantine and defence. However, if we turn the security question around with a focus on us banding together and the positive pooling of power and capacity by which, by, by which to better deal with security dilemmas, then the first question to be asked is actually what is to be secured, as opposed to against whom is, is it to be secured? Or put another way, what is the unit of security? Who is banding together? Which capacities are being pooled? And to what extent? We should take banding together to be, to be a function of the building of common purpose and community and the marshalling of material and economic resources to this end, a sub, a sub end of which is the achievement of greater levels of protection. On this view, greater agency is exercised by the population at large, whereby the state becomes less a, a leviathan and more a platform for unified purpose. At this stage of human evolution, it is empirically evident that the nation state is the elemental unit of security. Insofar as nation states are sovereign actors within their juridical boundaries, meaning both legal jurisdiction and territorial limits, and they in turn form an international society which has an, an anarchical quality, 
in the sense meant by Headley Bull, well known to this institution in his masterpiece of 1977. For the purposes of this lecture, I will only touch on the security dilemmas of international society and the resultant implications for statecraft and diplomacy. The unit of security creates juridical space for human difference, which is mediated and moderated by internal politico-legal constraints and norms, as evidenced, for instance, in this, by the security of property. Having established the unit of security, the nation state, we then have to ask ourselves how to conceive of and value security. Unless we assume that it is a universal, freestanding good, which everyone needs in the same way and to the same degree, that it is independent of beliefs, other values and interests, and that its practice entails no disagreement, which would be absurd given differing ideologies and interests within a society, and the requirement to, to allocate resources in priority order to all goods, then we need to establish a means of calculating the value of security and agreeing how best to effect it. Choices are made within the units of security about which security risks are to be treated and how, as an expression of, for instance, the resources to be expended on, for instance, military capability, countering terrorism, dealing with climate change, motor vehicle safety, and preventing cancer, diabetes, ob obesity, or suicide. As we make these choices, it is critically important that the vector of the threat is separated logically from the sector of impact. By this I mean that we should log logically separate the vector, whether it be an invading army, an enemy fleet, terrorists, saboteurs, cyber hackers, violent criminals, extreme weather events or a global pandemic and so on, from the sectors of society and the economy which are likely to be impacted and which will need to be defended, mobilised and or remediated. Relatedly, the logic and language I'm sorry, of war and security thinking should be reduced to its proper place and, and, and its legitimate place, which is to say the field of armed conflict, where it, it has enough to do. We have to view security as a capacity to generate effects. This leads logically, logically to thinking in effects or mission terms. Indeed, security cannot be practised in the absence of mission specifications, as I suggested earlier. Now, in recent years, some political scientists and philosophers, and I don't have time, I don't have time to reference them all tonight, have begun to, pre to press these questions. That is to say, questions such as security for whom? What is to be secured in terms of values, such as physical safety, national independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity, economic prosperity, social unity, individual liberty, liberty and or autonomy? From which threats? How much security is desired or required? What is the effect that is to be generated? By what means? Who will provide those resources? At what cost? Who is accountable? What is the duration period of the intended security effect? What is the operational concept, the strategy and the plan? Who will decide on, on adjustments during the execution of operations? Security is a purposive function, or activity I should say, whose hallmarks are unification of effort, clarity of goals and mission focus. Security is not solely a performative domain to adapt an idea from linguistic philosophy insofar as the speech acts, and I'm using that term technically from linguistics of security, do not in themselves fully constitute security effects. Security is not generated through rhetorical pronouncement or in a theatre of performance. Only through the generation of material effects can security be constituted and reproduced. Now, within government, we need to integrate all of our tools of national power in the pursuit of security effects. We need to continually examine how best to align missions and functions or, and how we might best integrate effort across organisational boundaries. Our systems, processes and capabilities have to become networked within new, new, uh, excuse me, national jurisdictions and across them with like-minded allies and partners. We need to aggressively tackle the problem of jurisdictional, regulatory and compliance gaps and seams especially as this relates to those parts of the world where ineffectual state control is in evidence and in relation to the illicit mode of globalisation which has emerged in recent decades, as evidence, for instance, in the global marketplace of illegal drugs. 
Security, however, extends beyond government. It is generated through the whole of society with government leading and guiding through a networked partnership with the rest of society, which is to say the population at large and the sectors, and the sectors to which I referred earlier. It follows logically that security has to be designed into societal structures, institutions and systems. It cannot be an afterthought or a supplementary appended function. It has to be ubiquitous without being oppressive. The domain of cyber will accelerate this imperative. The centuries-old nexus between the sovereign's protection and the spatial limits of the state is being deconstructed by cyber effects, where everyone and everything within the bordered state is externally facing and cyber exposed, and security cannot be assured within orthodox constructs. The approach that I should like to suggest this evening is to be distinguished from the mobilisation of society and the economy during times of total war, such as was seen during the Second World War, at least in periods th thereof, where there were theatres of combat, the home front, civil defence, industrial mobilisation, the protection of sea lanes, ports and harbours, and the rationing of food and supplies and so on. The mobilisation of which I speak here tonight is altogether different. It's, it involves security outside of total, total war, which has to be founded on a very different footing and effected through a radically different mechanism of national coordination. In, in the face of the discussion recently about grey zone conflict, the basic tenets of which are sound and from which flow logically coherent conclusions for action, there is a temptation, however, to move intellectually to a model of societal warfare, with the whole of society being mobilised to counter threats. However, our society is not a battle space. It is where we live. It is not human terrain over which security effects are imparted. There has been a concerning ten tendency, in my opinion, in recent years to import the language and the strategy of counterinsurgency practice and its underpinning orientation of fighting, quote, wars amongst the population into domestic society. This is dangerous, as it risks alienating the production of security effects from the population which is being secured. As an alternative, we should take an altogether different approach, one which starts with, with a deconstruction of the triangular oppositions between security, economic prosperity and social order or social unity, and which allows us to take a unified approach which brings security, economic and social functions together into a single conception and mechanism of national resilience where social and economic systems are characterised by continuity, redundancy and adaptability. We should, as a matter of national philosophy, practise adaptability and plan to recover from shocks always more strongly. Now, as societies and economies have become more complex and interconnected in recent years, new vulnerabilities have been added systematically, generating the increased likelihood and increased impacts of the disruption of supply chains, for instance, essential services and infrastructure. The more connections that we make and the more that networks expand, the more it is the case that risk is being introduced systematically into an ever more complex global grid of physical and virtual connectivity. Risk, as a result, is becoming more distributed, more networked and more interconnected than has ever been the case in human history. So much so that I would contend that calculating risk and, fr and framing resultant policy choices, or choices of policy, I should say, and options for action, has become an almost impossible challenge for traditional methods of decision making, which tend to be characterised by incremental option sets, empiricism as opposed to probabilistic conjecture, and more often than not, a default mode of aversion to risk. The complexity of modern human systems is such that the calculability of risk will become so difficult as to be practically impossible using traditional methods. In recent years, the field of natural security, whose ideas are drawn from biology, ecology and epidemiology, has emerged, perhaps pointing the way. I refer here especially to the work of the late Raf Sagaran. This approach suggests that we have to build by design into our social and economic systems, the adaptive features which are, the, which are evident in the biological domain, where survival and living with risk are a function of an organism's intrinsic ability to sense, to calculate and to act, 
to actively defend itself and to build redundancy and immunity, to employ countermeasures, to engage in deception and strike where necessary. In the biological world, the best response to external change is often internal change and an adaptation of the familiar. Today, one of the most vital security practices, if you want to use that language in this context, in the face of the threat of COVID-19, indeed is hand washing and good hand hygiene, a measure, with all due respect, CDF, which is far removed from the appearance and character of a complex weapon system, and yet of more importance to the current security of the population than every weapon in our armed forces. And in saying that, I have to applaud the wonderful work done by, done by the Australian Defence Force in the civil response to COVID-19. Now, this approach requires us to move away from the strategic language and thinking, which is typically confined or reduced to reducible linear concepts, which tend to be marked by concepts such as stability, friction, tension, momentum. In a networked world, a less mechanistic and more organic conception is required, which is marked by concepts such as risk, the chronic state as opposed to the acute state, susceptibility, immunity, contagion, virulence. During the Cold War, we spoke of a balance of forces in a physical and mechanical world. Today, we should speak of what we think reality to be in an organic and networked world. The laws of physics have certainly not been suspended, but for some decades, we acted as if the laws of biology had been. Now, for centuries after the rise of the modern nation state in Europe in the 17th century, and I referred earlier to Hobbes, we tended to think of the state as possessing majestic power, indeed, Hobbes's Leviathan, with symbols of that power displayed atop the houses of parliament and court buildings. Now, in an era where global forces are seeing the erosion of the, the ability of the sovereign to guarantee internal peace and protect us from external foes, nothing less than the, tran than the transformation of the state itself and the state's relationship with society is required. The idea of security, in quotes, should be best associated with notions of reassurance and relative peace of mind. Its etymology points the way. Security comes from late Middle English and in turn from Latin, securitas, meaning the condition of being secure, from securus, free, free from care or concern. Security should evoke the sense of, a sense of protection, safety, safeguarding, safekeeping. Think of the idea of a security blanket, an object dependent upon for reassurance and comfort. When we secure something, we make it safe. We speak, therefore, of emotional security, financial security, job security, and so on. Security, in this sense, is a, is a systemic feature of a secure situation, characterised in my profession by ideas such as defence in depth, access control, identity assurance, asset protection, continuity, and vulnerability mitigation, to use some of the terms of my art. Security also, though, has a related meaning, meaning of a thing which is deposited or pledged as a guarantee of a fulfilment of an undertaking or the repayment of a loan to be forfeited in case of default. Its synonyms, its synonyms in this case are guarantee, collateral, surety, pledge, bond. Security in this sense underpins trust and confidence, such as that required to invest, to accept rulings in relation to property, equity and torts. Security, when read in these ways, is a positive condition which enables or underpins prosperity and unity and underpins markets, political discourse, democratic institutions, laws and regulations, public administration, accountability in public and corporate institutions and, indeed, criminal and civil justice. Security, on my reading, has to be read as a means to an end. Its effects enable to the pursuit of happiness and prosperity, which are the greater ends. Security has to be visibly connected, therefore, to prosperity, social cohesion and unity and the maintenance of an open and free society. To separate security as a function of state in the sense of a security state, or worse, a deep state, is illogical and a misnomer. Security is an intrinsic function of state. That is not, however, the same as is meant in illiberal discourse, where there is to be found the idea of state security. The very idea of state security separates the state from the population, such that the security of the former becomes the principal end in itself. Now, contrary to the authoritarian discourse of state security, security should be supervised by institutions which are separate from the executive state 
and discussion about security should be as free and as open as possible, subject only to strictly applied secrecy limitations, which are con concerned genuinely with the protection of sensitive capabilities and operations and intelligence sources and methods. Now, on this account, national security has a particular meaning insofar as, as it is concerned with a narrower but still significant scope of security, namely the security and defence of the nation state, whether in its military attack or attacks by state or non-state actors, which transgress potentially the political independence, the sovereignty, the integrity, including the territorial integrity of that nation state. In this sense, a nation is secure when it does not have to sacrifice or compromise on its national interests in order to avoid war or armed aggression, and is able to protect those interests by engaging, if necessary, in the use of force. For this reason, I am not an advocate of, for expanding the definition of national security. Where would one stop if one were to embark on that course? If the concept of security becomes a synonym for all desirable policy values such as sovereignty, prosperity, equality, liberty, unity, then security becomes the entire policy agenda. I am in favour, however, of emphasising concepts such as self-reliance and sovereign capability in national policy discourse, which would require the closer integration of security, economic and social policy. And for this reason, the most important challenge in this area does not relate to structures and institutional alignment around national security. This simply avoids, avoids the higher challenge of thinking through the proper integration of security, economic and social policy. None of which is to say that hard security, as it's sometimes referred to, is no longer an imperative. Please don't get me wrong. In relation to security from military attack, for instance, our basic national security objective remains the deterrence of and defence against, as required, direct armed attack. And in relation to territorial integrity, globalisation and the relatively free movement of goods, people, services and capital has not so deterritorialised the state such as to unravel the direct coupling between, of security, territory and population, as indeed we've been reminded through the impact of COVID-19. Now, colleagues, in my speech last year delivered in March to ASPE titled Seven Gathering Storms, National Security in the 2020s, I attempted to make some sense of the strategic risks that we confront as they relate to national security. I did not on that occasion intend to cover all risks to prosperity, security and unity. Today, today, or tonight indeed, I will go further. If one were to construct a national risk register, it would be immediately apparent that some of these risks are not national security issues at all, unless that term is intended, as I said a moment ago, to encompass risks which go to the prosperity and unity of the, of the nation and its character as a free and open democratic polity. What follows is not ranked as a set of predictions, or uh, is it a priority order for policy? It represents a framework of risks which I have cast over a century to the year 2120, which might materialise and which therefore demand our close attention. So here is my expanded register that supplants and indeed replaces the speech otherwise known as seven gathering storms. The prospect of great power war which carries with it the prospect of nuclear war. The employment of chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear weapons outside of great power war. Cyber attacks, many of which are in reality cyber-enabled espionage, but which could also entail catastrophic attacks on critical national infrastructure. The subversion of our democratic institutions, including our elections, and the fragmentation of our social cohesion by way of foreign interference, political warfare, and disinformation, or misinformation through what some have termed the death of truth and the weaponisation of social media and declining trust in public institutions. Espionage against our decision-making processes and in relation to our military, diplomatic, governmental, scientific and technological secrets. Ungoverned territory and the failure of state authority in parts of the world often linked to corruption and unmitigated urban sprawl, which can lead to state failure or civil conflict within failing and failed states, creating in turn safe havens and staging points for terror and crime. Uncontrolled mass migration, including as a result of civil conflict and or climate change, 
as well as mass human trafficking and people smuggling. Terrorist attacks, whether by transnational or domestic terrorists, with Islamist terrorist groups being of the greatest concern due to their global reach, although of increasing concern, is the rise of fascist extremist groups. Politically motivated violence within the meaning of the ASIO Act 1979, including by armed groups which might be motivated by conspiratorially framed ideologies. The mass economic and social impact of transnational criminal networks, which can represent a strategic threat to economies, to good government, governance and public order, to revenue base, bases and border integrity. Poorly managed supply chains, which can be penetrated by transnational criminal networks for economic gain, as they mask the illicit movement of goods in the vast volumes of trade movements. Poorly managed travel networks, which can become a vector for people smuggling, human trafficking, and of course for the transmission of pandemics. Poorly managed transport security in aviation and shipping, which can be a vector for terrorist attack, as well as enabling transnational serious and organised crime. The sabotage or sustained outage of critical physical infrastructure and information networks, including data, satellites and undersea cables. Global capital flows which mask investments and economic activities which might be detrimental to national security and other forms of economic war warfare, including by way of the strategic acquisition and control of national security sensitive businesses. Illicit money mo flows which mask money laundering and terrorist financing. Supply chain risks as they relate to the lack of sovereignty in certain manufacturing and supply categories, such as medical equipment and supplies, specialist mach machinery and critical parts and components. Critically exploited, ubiquitous end-to-end -end encryption, the dark web, poorly managed data storage, mass data theft and identity fraud. The adverse consequences of advanced technology, especially artificial intelligence and potentially synthetic biology. Microbiobial resistance, a global pandemic, we're living through one of those, or worse, worse, a deliberate bio-warfare attack. Agricultural diseases and food insecurity. Water and resource shortages, severe energy shocks and the disruption of energy supplies. Increased disaster and climate risk, biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. Major natural disasters, including earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions and geomagnetic storms mentioned earlier, as well as extreme weather, weather events such as fires, floods and storms. And finally, I've got to the end of the list, and environmental damage and disasters such as major oil spills, significant industrial accidents and radioactive contamination. Now, this is an apocalyptic list to be sure. Indeed, in relation to ways in which humanity might become extinct, you will find arguable cases for the following scenarios. Amongst others, a deliberately released humanity-killing synthetic virus, super volcanic eruptions which block the sun, the Terminator AI threat, a nuclear apocalypse, and yes, the killer asteroid. Complacency is certainly not warranted in the face of this register, please don't get me wrong, but nor is an existentially pessimistic fatalism an exaggerated sense of threat, of danger rather, is positively harmful, as is the over-application of threats. Overarming the state is as great a danger as underpowering it. The best accounts, in my view, of how to strike the right balances are not surprisingly written by experienced practitioners. And I point to work such as David Kilcullen's latest book, The Dragon and the, S and the Snakes, How the Rest Learned to Fight the West. Janet Napolitano's uh, former Homeland Security Secretary, How Safe Are We? Homeland Security Since 9-11, published last year. And slightly older, Sir David Oman's Securing the State, 2010. All of whom focus on sustaining secure and resilient nations with a clear-eyed view of risks and threats. I, I intend to return at some future point to the issue of the design and functioning of public institutions and the national sectors in light of this broad conception of security. For the purpose of tonight's lecture, several concluding thoughts suggest themselves. First, public institutions have to be designed to operate at the intersection of prosperity, security and unity. Security has to be subordinated 
to the greater end of an open, prosperous and unified society. Security itself is an array of effects which support resilience and which are generated through a cycle of practices, namely threat scanning, risk management, planning, preparation, exercising and, of course, operations, including first response, emergency management and, as necessary, of course, disaster recovery and reconstruction. Security should focus on the logical anticipation of dangers to come and is best informed by a realistic, as distinct perhaps from a neurotic anxiety, which is centred on defined dangers or at least imaginable dangers. I therefore do not deny a, re a link of sorts to fear and, an and anxiety, but nor would I start there. The, the foregoing analysis also suggests a notion of the operational state. Within government, departments and agencies have to be designed to be operational, able to plan, to prepare and to undertake operational missions as directed. The age of the programmat programmatic or regulatory agency that arose in the 1980s and has been with us up until recently is passing. While of course they have their place, these agencies, even in wartime, departmental operations which are focused on the pursuit of purposive, purposeful outcomes as distinct from the supervision of an arm's length process are back in vogue and not before time. While there has been in recent years much done to better link law enforcement, security intelligence, countering foreign interference, countering terrorism, immigration, citizenship, social cohesion, customs, border protection, maritime security, critical infrastructure protection, aviation and port security, supply chain security, cyber security, emergency management, disaster recovery, that's not just my job's description by the way, it's a team effort, <laughs> biosecurity and public health management and so on, governments will always be mindful of opportunities to achieve yet more scale and more agility in the generation of operational effects. Now, while national security effects will typically be, continue to be delivered by the principal departments of state, foreign affairs and trade, defence, and I acknowledge again the presence of the CDF here tonight, and home affairs, working either alone or in some form of combination, security effects in the, in the conception that I've laid out are also being delivered through other combinations, such as the partnerships that my department, the Department of Home Affairs, has with Treasury, foreign investment screening, agriculture, biosecurity, transport, aviation and maritime security, communications in the area of telecommunications security, for instance, in relation to the deployment of 5G technology, industry, as in the Department of Industry in terms of supply chains and scientific research, energy in relation to energy security, health clearly in relation to pandemic response, and indeed education, where we've got a particularly close collaboration in relation to foreign interference in universities. This also, though, leads, if I go back to one of my themes, to the notion of the extended state. This is not just about how government inter organises itself internally. What do I mean by the extended state? Perhaps the time has come to speak of the extended state, where public institutions in the executive remain the vital centre, as they possess convening power, threat intelligence, regulatory powers, for instance, in relation to the creation and enforcement of security obligations on industry, emergency powers as laid down in law, and the operational capabilities and capacities of government of which I've been speaking tonight. The extended state for the purposes of security as I've defined it, uh, which is a networked and dynamic conception which comprehends sectors across society and the economy, consists indeed therefore of the entire apparatus of the national government, which convenes and coordinates, along with state, territory and municipal governments, as well as the business sector, including finance and banking, food and groceries, health and medical services, transport, freight and logistics, water supply and sanitation, utilities, energy, fuel, telecommunications, the scientific and industrial research establishment of the nation, as well as not-for-profit and community organisations, including charities and households, of course, as might be required in the security enterprise. So, colleagues, to conclude, security is a shared responsibility which should be designed into our plural institutions and processes in order to ensure the resilience of the prosperity and unity of our nation and its character as a free and open democratic polity. We have to think of it as continuously generated effects to this end, 
In a democracy, the nation's security enterprise should be supervised within a juridical framework of separated powers. We should resist the law, coll the law colleagues of illiberal discourse, which says that unitary authorities are more effective security performers. They are not. Security should, entail the should not entail the administration of fearful and anxious subjects. Security should be contested by an informed citizenry who share a common horizon of threat awareness and agency in relation to risk and opportunity. On this reading, security is a dialectic between the state's mandate and capacity to act and the population's collective specification of the trade-offs and the costs that it is willing to bear in the name of protection and survival. In the end, security effects construct social life insofar as they underpin prosperity and unity, whereby the greater, the greater social end is the pursuit of happiness or utility in the sense that a philosopher or indeed an economist might use that term. As such, security is more than a question of protection or of survival. It is a question of how we should band together and pool our capacities for living. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. That was, uh, that was really formidable and I would say that um, uh, if, uh, if you didn't have a day job, I think we'd be inviting you for some, um, some guest lectures into our, uh, our master's program. But I think what we've, what we've heard there is a distillation, obviously, of, um, of extensive experience, but with a very, very strong conceptual framework that I think is going to, to challenge us, challenge our thinking. I would like to open up some questions. I'd like to ask you one or two questions first, uh, but I think also it looks like your remarks today will be quite an enduring resource that we're very, very keen to put out there into the public, um, into the public domain. My first question so that, that list to you, said 25, by the way, in case you're losing There we go. 25, yeah. My first question to you, really, and then I'll hmm. invite questions from the audience, because we do have... Uh, as well as uh, leaders of the national security community, uh, scholars. We have students in the room as well who I'm sure will have questions. But my first question for you would be to, to take the, I think, the, the very conceptual level of recommendation, because I think there was recommendation at the end of that, um, of, of that really rich um, presentation. Take that back to the specifics, which I know you deal with in your day job every day, uh, and that is um, engaging that whole of society approach on national security, engaging uh, the private sector, state governments, the citizenry in a democracy. How do you think Australia is going on that journey and how do you think the kind of message that you've um, presented tonight uh, will, will, will resound over the years ahead? I think. Um when you say how, how's Australia going, it's always best to bench, benchmark one comparatively. And in terms of our ability to prop, to be very flexible, to be very agile, and I'm just running through my mind as I'm answering, thinking in my job, I've had the great honour and the privilege in working with a lot of colleagues here. In the morning, you might be talking about the restrictions at the border. Through the morning, you're, you've got the heads of Woolworths, Coles and the independent groups about how, how food's going to be put on the shelves in, in COVID impacted areas, you're, you're brokering a, an agreement and uh, I really uh, want to publicly acknowledge the great work done by Rod Sims and his colleagues at the ACCC to broker a temporary suspension of anti-cartel arrangements so that uh, each of supermarkets could mm. uh, stock each other's uh, warehouses as they were falling over potentially with COVID um, uh, infection detections. Uh, you're then getting uh, briefings. They're always the most terrifying briefings from, from the Director General of ASD about you know, another hack that's come in, uh, to, to which, uh, Rachel, I hope you don't mind me saying, I often go, thanks, Rachel, what are you doing about it? <laughs> uh, and, then, and then you roll on to uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a briefing from the head of the Criminal Intelligence Commission saying we're just about to resolve um, and you know, do a major job in terms of a massive importation. Now, um, I, I would... In a comparative sense, 
and you know you always got to, got to be very careful about how you mark yourself. When I speak to colleagues around the world, both not just Five Eyes but like-minded uh, people, let's say in the Western liberal democratic tradition, when you talk to them about a day like that, they go, oh, "Really? Uh, it would take us a long time to convene the IDC to convene the inter you know the interagency process. We don't have the authorities. We can't even speak to the you know the head of the Signals Authority or." What, what do you mean? You spoke to the head of the military, what, and he took your call, uh, and yes, uh, 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 the, the CDF takes my calls and I'm very happily, very uh, privileged to take his. Um, oh, what, what do you mean? You've just had a discussion with the Deputy Secretary for National Security in, in Prime Minister and Cabinet, and things are happening already. To be honest, Rory, I think by that metric we're doing very well. Could we do better? Absolutely. Life is about continual improvement and critical self-reflection. But when I hear the experiences played back to me of, of like-minded partners, they say, oh, that, that took a month or mm. that took a week. And, and there's often things that we can learn nonetheless from them. The population at large, um, different sort of answer. I think, uh, and there's a whole discussion to be had, um, which goes off into sociology and all sorts of things. I think, I think Aust Australian national culture is resilient for all sorts of reasons. The nature of settlement, the encounter, First Nations, then British settlement, waves of immigration, opening up a continent, to use that rather sort of quaint 18th or 19th century term. You can contest that history. You can put uh, graffiti on statues if you wish. It is a history that's sort of forged uh, a culture. It's forged a set of both political and cultural institutions. It is highly uh, utilitarian, pragmatic, pragmatic. There's nothing more than a, that an Australian honours more than someone who gets on the tools and just gets the job done and indeed doesn't involve themselves in a whole lot of conceptual abstraction. So uh, my speech tonight must remain as a secret amongst the, the very small audience that we have here because it's not really in keeping with the Aussie character. Look, we, but there is something yeah. <laughs> in saying that we do get on and do things. So both at the governmental level, the institutions, our interaction with business and the population at large, touch wood, there's no wood here, I think we can say that our balanced response, whether it was bushfires, the storms and floods, and then of course pandemic, in a way that doesn't just focus on a single metric, either the death rate from the pandemic or, or how you might have a balanced outcome which is containing the pandemic, keeping uh, 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 mortality low, but also not having such a deep gouge of your GDP. I think on, on an all-round basis, I think we're doing very well. That's, I, mean, I would say that, of course, but I think yeah. there's a lot of evidence that, that could back there's that. There's a lot there and there's a lot we could unpack further and we'll come back to the, the, you know, the role of intellectualism in Australian culture another time, Mike. But um, state governments is the yep. one bit I didn't hear a lot about there. Yep. It'd be interesting to understand how you think state governments, state and territory governments, are progressing on this whole of nation security journey or security as part of the, the greater good journey? Well, I think um, the, uh, the best way to answer that question is really by way of reference to how the Prime Minister's described not only his own thought process but the, the resolution that he arrived at with his leaders, with his fellow jurisdictional leaders quite early in the piece to say we need a lot of cut through, we need a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. Our public officials do terrific work but if ministers and officials um, are allowed to, you know, we, our bread and butter is meetings, IDCs, um, what uh, the forum no, formerly known as COAG, many subordinated ministerial committees and councils. The PM took the view. He obviously won the agreement of his peers as the nation's leaders in the federation that we need a different model and so, hence national cabinet. So I refer you to how he's described his own thinking, his own rationale, and what the premiers and chief ministers themselves have said, and certainly the officials in this room who participate in the deliberations, or at least in the margins, see uh, the, the impact. They'll have a discussion, decisions will come out, we get, we get things done. The point I made in my, in my speech is that's about pandemic response. Well, let's not reinvent the wheel in relation, for instance, to cyber resilience. States and territories, and indeed municipal governments that I touched on in, in my speech, hold a lot of data. They manage a lot of uh, sensitive networks, either directly or by way of uh, infrastructure that they licence through you know, state uh, utility arrangements and the like. Let's not reinvent the wheel every time we come at a particular vector. And that's why the argument I put in my speech is um, don't just have a sector response to a vector problem. Now, after 9-11, just to finish on that point, the states and territories and others all had to mobilise around the prospect of mass casualty attacks. Yeah. 
we, we built a lot of depth and ballast in, in our CT arrangements, and they've been honed over about 20 years. Yes, there were some arrangements that went back to the late 70s, but the contemporary uh, generation, if you like, of CT arrangements really emerged in the aftermath of the terrible attacks of 9-11. Of they are fit for purpose for that vector and sector problem. They are not necessarily easily replicated, and indeed that's been seen in how we've had to um, purpose build some arrangements for other matters. Now, the point of my contention tonight is it's all one federation, all one set of nine governments, federal six states and two territories, we should on an enduring basis have those contacts, those arrangements, the connectivity, the SOPs, standard operating procedures, preset for, for all vectors and all sectors on a truly all hazards approach. You think that's that's coming? Yes. Yeah. Well, in fact, not only is it coming, we've, in a sense, as we've all become aficionados yeah. of uh, video conferences and very few of us had, uh, you know, good uh, video conference etiquette up until about nine months ago, the federations had to sort of adapt in the same way that we're all adapting to technology and uh, in the same way that telemedicine was rolled out over a week. Things that had been talked about and contemplated you know, you, you know, there's some wonderful uh, discourse out there about all hazards, uh, national coordination arrangements. You probably would fill a, an auditorium like this with staff college papers and the rest of it. These leaders just had to make it happen. So a lot of that distilled wisdom was able to be pretty rapidly deployed. And it's, it's here and it's not sliding it's, back. In it's here. Soon. So we've got the 1.0 version. Let's just keep building from there. Great. Look, in the short time we have, I want to offer opportunity to others in the room to ask questions of Mike Pizzullo because he, here's your chance. And there are a number of students in the room, so I particularly want to uh, privilege the students, some from the, uh, the Master of National Security Policy here at NSC. Except for my two sons, because we, uh, we can pick up this argument at yeah. on, on <laughs> Sunday night to, at our yeah, barbecue. We'll, we'll get to the family stuff. <laughs> uh, so if you've got a question, please try and get uh, attention, uh, get my attention, and we've got a microphone or two here. Uh, and uh, if, if any of the students don't have questions, I'll be having words with you after, afterwards. Uh, who'd like to ask a question of, um, of our guest? I'm going to um, nominate you, James. <laughs> Not a student anymore. I know. And, and James is a, uh, a, a recently minted NSC PH, uh, PhD. So. Uh, thank you very much for uh, throwing me on the chopping block. Um, uh, Mike, if I may, thank you very much, um, and especially edifying for myself, as Rory mentioned, I've just completed a PhD on the history of national security in the Western tradition. Um, so I had a great time working out whether or not you'd plagiarise me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my question, if I'm to have one, you mentioned, uh, Essentially, you mentioned securitisation, that security isn't performative. It's not a speech act in and of itself, which I really appreciate hearing, um, and that it should be judged on its material effects. But at the same time that security... Should we, should we, we should stay away from state security, away from that notion of authoritarian, you know, top-down security, if I can call it that, um, which I also appreciate. What I was wondering, though, is... Uh, how can we as a democracy have the conversation that's necessary to maintain that security? It's all well and good, I think, to call it jurisdictional or, or jurisprudence sort of base, um, but especially given what's going on in, say, our, our close friends in the US, especially in places like Portland, how can we as a society have a healthy conversation around that to forge what we as a nation know as security? Because ultimately it seems to me that if it is to be judged by its material effects, we as a nation or as a, as a society much, need to have a much clearer idea of what it is we're trying to express. It's a, a great question. Pl please send me a copy of your, uh, your PhD, which I'll, which I'll read uh, with, uh, with interest. Uh, Ke Kendra will, will, will take a note of the email address. Um, I'll, look, I'll, an I'll answer it like this, and indeed I'll, I'll do it by way of performative illustration, if, if I might. C can anyone think of... of too many, if any, other jurisdictions in the world where in an auditorium such as this, uh, we have the head of the military, the head of the, in what would be in some cases called the Ministry of State Security or Internal, Internal Security, but the head of the Criminal Intelligence uh, Commission, which has got coercive compulsory powers over and above that afforded to police forces, 
we, had, we have the head of the Signals Intelligence Agency and the Cyber Security Authority, who just recently gave a speech here, uh, following her predecessor, Mike Burgess, but really expanding out the discussion of the history of, of ASD and DSD going back to the uh, Second uh, World War. We have the head of the clandestine secret intelligence service. Uh, in, in Brian the wasn't sure if he should name him, but I think uh, it's, no, it's all good. By law, uh, only Director General Simon can be named. Uh, the naming of any other officer is a criminal offence. But here's uh, Paul Simon. His predecessor, uh, uh, I'm chancing my arm here, Paul, maybe only eight years ago, gave a speech, the first speech by Director General of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, an agency which was only declared to the parliament and to the Australian public in 1977, as recently, certainly within my uh, lifetime. I was 13. Um, and, of course, we have the head of the Border Authority uh, and Immigration Enforcement Authority in Michael Outram. Uh, I won't speak on behalf of, of, of my... And, and I should... Sorry, Caroline, with all due, my apologies. The head of, effectively, the National Security Advisor of Australia, the Deputy Secretary for National Security in the Prime Minister's Department, in Caroline Miller. Wonderful colleagues, people... Uh, with whom I interact m many times a day, sometimes too many times a day, they, they might think, um, and either collectively, and there are other colleagues uh, who have been in this room. In, w in what other country would you have, and you see them here, with, there's no security detail. Uh, now we take risks, they manage risks. Um, there's, not, there's no black SUVs, there's no uh, gentlemen typically with big bulky suits speaking to their uh, cufflinks. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a, as wonderful and as open a democracy, I suppose, uh, I, should, I should say, probably in New Zealand, um, uh, they would argue that they've got the same openness. And look, we're kin in that sense. We're in, a, in the sense of European settlement, we're cousins, let, let's say. It, it doesn't happen. And the fact that, I won't speak for my colleagues, we all have families, we are, we're citizens. We've also got issues about, um, you know, thinking about the future of our children making ends meet, um, not so much these days, because uh, our, our youngest uh, doesn't need to be driven around to sporting fields, but getting them to sports on a, on a Saturday, uh, and so on and so forth. I, I just think we have the opportunity. I don't want to get emotional about it or sentimental about it, but in Australia, I think we hold our institutions in about the right level of reverence, i.e. not very much, but just enough to say, OK, we know you're busy and, OK, we'll address you as Prime Minister, but otherwise, you know, this is what I need from you, right? We're a very utilitarian, pragmatic... Uh, a political scientist in the 80s, uh, 1980s called a Benthamite society, right? We're a truly Benthamite society. I think that's great. That said, can we be more open? Yes. I mentioned uh, Rachel's re recent address from this very podium, and I won't speak for you, Rachel, but I think you intend to uh, say more things and potentially say uh, more about what is done uh, at... When I joined the public service in 1987, things that would never have been even contemplated for, for public disclosure. There's been more, more disclosure in recent years about our military operations, both by the present CDF and, and his predecessors. There's been more discussion about ASIS uh, than, than I, frankly, would have ever thought possible when I was first given my ASIS briefing 33 and a half years ago, saying, you never talk about them. Ever. Now, you know, we don't want to talk too much uh, <laughs> about it, but, but look, a, a balanced, proportionate expansion of the public discourse in this, in this field, I think, is a very, very healthy thing. Now, you then, then have to discuss, and, and in fact, the community will go through this discussion because of the inquiry, and I'll finish on this point, that the mm -hmm. Parliamentary Joint Committee has made into press freedom. When, when government officials classify things and they put top secret or secret or protected or whatever, what, are the, what is the appropriate and proportionate scaling of those um, classifications? Is it all just being classified because we don't want FOI disclosure? What are the, what are the things that, in the Cold War, they used to, they used to talk of the denoter system and, and you know, that, that's all sort of fallen into, into, into misuse and I'm not suggesting for a moment that that ought to be... Um, uh, re resurrected in any way, shape or form. But at least there was a discussion that said, OK, I, I get it. This has to be kept secret because people would die. This has to be kept secret because were we to be, God forbid, in a war, our weapon systems would be compromised. OK, you're really only keeping this secret for convenience or to, for avoidance of a scandal. I think, I think the more precise, to go back to my speech, the more specification we put around those concepts, rather than just putting labels, 
government bureaucrat, secretive, press open and free, and somehow altruistic and disinterested. They're never trying to scoop each other. There's never any issue of, of, of which stable is involved. Um, Ken, where's Kendra? Are you going to restrain me here? Or like she's saying, don't, don't, stop that line. Um, so look, there are, inter go. <laughs> there are interests in society. Let's just be open and upfront. The, the notion that somehow the, the colleagues that I've just identified, myself included, are tyrannical, despotic, you know, plotting behind closed doors to oppress the Australian population, were it only for, uh, you know, the altruistic fourth estate, is frankly just an exaggeration, a caricature and a trope. Let's have a sensible, a sensible discussion. And of course, and I'll finish on this point, there's another set of regulatory bodies here, the various, body, the various oversight bodies that we're all accountable to. A lot, there's a lot of discussion about ICAC and there's a lot of discussion about various commissions that oversee. Nearly all of us are under various forms of Royal Commission level coercive oversight every day. Everything that I do, Michael Phelan's the same, Michael Outram's the same, there are different arrangements for the intelligence agencies. We're understanding Royal Commissions. And I've got to say it's liberating, because you know what the rules are. A Royal Commissioner could roll, roll into my organisation, into anything we're doing at any time and out whatever they want. And that's frankly liberating, because you go, yep, you've, you, you've got that self-restraining, self-censoring idea of you've got to do the right thing anyway, and if you, if you don't, you're going to get caught anyway. And I think that's the point I make about the separation of powers in a democracy. If you separate and distribute the powers, you have better outcomes. And I will cut you off there, because uh, we are very much at time. I think I was hoping uh, to generate a few more questions, but I think we're just beginning this conversation in many ways. Uh, so, Mike, we have to have you back, uh, whether it's uh, in an open forum, Chatham House, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. I want to wrap up with one final very quick question, sure. um, and that really goes to the, uh, the personal Well, if you, if you didn't ask me about the history of 500 years of political philosophy, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have to speak at length. It's but anyway. all there. Yeah, it's all there. We, we, it's we, a great we'll question. Come, we'll come back to it, and I will make sure that James, James' thesis reaches you. Thank Look, you. You did mention your family earlier, so I just actually yeah. want to wrap up on this note. I think I kind of, kind of cheekily alluded to your day job, and I know that being Secretary of Home Affairs or any of these other agencies is not exactly just a day job. So just a, a tiny bit of career advice to those in this space, uh, or those who, who really aspire to careers in this space. How do you keep it in balance? How do you balance the responsibilities uh, that you have in this role with a family life, with a personal life? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very apt question, given that half of my family is, is here uh, tonight. Uh, and as I said, in Australia, we hold our institutions at the correct level of, relevant, of reverence, i.e. not much. Well, uh, no one is no one is revered as a as a sovereign within their family. I can assure you, it's a it's a very democratic outfit. There are a lot of lot of debates, a uh, lot of very open discussions. There's no uh, there's no sovereign ruling, even though occasionally uh, one tries to uh, get away with that stunt. No, but there's a lot of democratic to and fro. Point one, uh, point two. Like all of our families, in in all of their different shapes and all of their different uh, compositions. Uh, there's that deep love, and, and the, the point I made in my speech is better always to focus on the things that bring us together, the pooling, the banding together. Yeah, and then, of course, you've got to think about the things that threaten that. But if you start with the threat, you live a fearful and anxious life. If you start with common purpose, and frankly, the most common purpose, that is in our, in our genes, in our culture, in our evolutionary biology going back, whichever you know, theory of evolution you, you, you buy into, is that elemental notion of coming together as a family for both procreation, for living, uh, and the rest of it. So it's a nice note to, note to end on. That banding together, I couldn't have literally done it without my beautiful uh, wife, Lynn, who's been through, through it for, um, through a third of a century, and we've still got a bit to go, darling. Uh, she's actually got a PhD, so she's the actual intellectual, whereas, uh, whereas I just fainted a bit. Uh, and it's great having Anthony and Sam here as well. And, uh, and in absentia, I should also include Nicholas and, and Carissa in those remarks. So whether it's a family, whether it's a street neighbourhood, uh, whether it's a suburb or, 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 or your other associations which are not territorial, sporting clubs, places of faith, uh, other community groups, and then you sort of keep building up. If we just simply start with the point of view that we're all uh, atoms, disconnected, we somehow reinvent our connections every day. Well, A, that's not human experience, because right from childhood we're in a web of connections, 
a web of linkages, a web of associations, and all through life. Um, you draw on those webs initially as a child as you, you know, grow your capacity and capability. Then you go into adulthood, adulthood. Hopefully you contribute more back than you take in and you, you know, pass on. And then, you know, when we get to the, you know, when we get to the end and they're about to, you know, roll you out, you know, you can hopefully look back and say, I made a contribution, not just for me and my family, but in those other social constructs as, as well. So if you, if you start with family and then build out to common purpose, collective purpose and solidarity, I think that is the way in which we should have a discussion, whether it's about security or anything else, rather than starting from insularity, myopia, fear and anxiety. Look, I think it's, it, it's wonderful to end on that note, connecting security with living, putting security in its place. You heard it here at the National Security College. Look, thank you very much, uh, Mike. And I might ask now uh, all of you to join me uh, to thank our speaker. Before I do, just to note that, of course, the recording of this will be available on the ANU YouTube channel and the National Security Pol Podcast. And thank you also to my colleagues. Please join me in thanking Mike. Thanks, Rory, and thanks, thanks for coming. Thank you.